Uh oh. Okay, we'll start with this, an announcement that wasn't on my bingo card. Apparently, newly crowned WBC champion Mario Barrios will be defending his WBC title for the first time against Abel Ramos off-platform. What? He's going to be boxing on the undercard of Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul in November. I didn't see this coming. I didn't know there was any interest from Netflix to bring Mario over to their side of things. So up until recently, we had been hearing rumors about Pacquiao facing Mario Barrios in the fall as part of an Amazon Prime pay-per-view. Oh. Tentatively, though. It wasn't confirmed. They were just rumors and rumblings. A fleeting interest from Manny Pacquiao to face Mario. Then those rumors turned into rumors about a Pacquiao versus Ryan Garcia fight. An exhibition. All the while, Eddie Hearn stated that offers had gone out to the other champions at the weight to unify with boots. Mario Barrios among them. So what this confirms is there ain't gonna be no Pacquiao versus Barrios fight, there ain't gonna be no Barrios versus Boots fight, and there ain't gonna be no Barrios versus Amantis Stanionis fight. Oh, we'll get to that. Mario Barrios sports professional record, 29 wins with two losses, no draws, 18 knockouts, having been knocked out once in 31 professional bouts. His sole knockout defeat came at the hands of Gervonta Davis at 140 pounds. He's won some fights and he's lost some fights, but over Overall, he does have a solid resume, a solid level of experience, having been in there with the likes of Gervonta and Keith Thurman and Jordanis Ugas more recently, Fabian Maidania. He's been around. Abel Ramos sports professional record of 28 wins with 6 losses, 2 draws, 22 knockouts, having been knocked out once in 36 professional bouts. A seasoned veteran, another guy who's been around. He last saw action earlier this year opposite the ring Juan Roman Guzman, who he stopped in five rounds. That was in April, where Mario Barrios, the defending champion, saw action a month later in May opposite the ring Fabian Maidana on the undercard of the Canelo Alvarez versus Jaime Munguia fight. Mario's been keeping a good, steady schedule of activity. He fought two times last year, and he's set to fight two times this one. So there's no ring rust to shake off on either side of this thing. The danger, though, the danger is that he's boxing off-platform on neutral terrain, on neutral ground. You will remember that Isaac Cruz, not that long ago, defended his title for the first time against Rayo Valenzuela on the end of Carter Crawford versus Madrimov, and he lost. Off-platform. Isaac lost. I happen to think if that same fight would have happened on the PBC side of things, the same way, the exact same fight, Isaac would have got the nod. Isaac would have got the decision because the PBC are perhaps more invested in Isaac than they are in Rayo. The way it happened, it happened on neutral terrain. So he didn't get special consideration, the kind he would get boxing under his own banner on his own platform. He didn't get that. That's the danger that Mario is facing. That over there on Netflix, well, you're not a Netflix fighter. This is not a PBC show. You're on even terrain with this guy, so you've got to really beat him. Got to do it. Mario Barrio said, I'm thrilled to be part of this once in a lifetime event. The fight on Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson's card is huge, with millions watching live on Netflix. Abel Ramos is a tough Mexican fighter just like me, so I know it'll be a hell of a fight in front of my Texas people at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Always the optimist and looking on the bright side, it is true. This is a chance for Mario to fight in front of 
more people than he usually does. More people than he ever could over there on PBC and Amazon. Because remember, this is not a pay-per-view. This is not a box office fight. This is going to be available to every Netflix subscriber worldwide as part of their subscription. Netflix hosts approximately 277 million subscribers worldwide. If even a fraction of that number tune into this show, it's going to get Mario major promotion, major exposure. What he has to do is hold up his end of the bargain, keep the WBC title, and do it in good fashion. Could be beneficial, or it could be a disaster. How did all of this come to being? Well, the people at Most Valuable Promotions and Netflix needed something and someone, some someones, to populate the undercard for this show. But I don't think the MVP stable was deep enough. It's not enough there. Wanted some familiar faces. I remember reading the amount of money they're paying out to Katie Taylor to come over from DAZN over to Netflix to have this rematch with Amanda and I'd wager they also paid generously Mario to come over to their side and defend his title on this undercard. Now when exactly this offer from Netflix went out to Mario, your guess is as good as mine. Was it before? or after Eddie Hearn made him an offer to unify with Boots. It might have been before, which is why Mario turned it down. The offer from Netflix might have come in before the offer from Matchroom. It might. Or maybe after. Maybe Mario, like a Montestanionis and Brian Norman, he didn't like the offer from Matchroom, and comes this offer, and he signs on. Looks to me like the PBC wasn't gonna have this guy doing a whole lot. Either way that it happened, it looks to me like the PBC wasn't gonna have Mario doing much of anything in the fall, in the winter, because if they were, they would not have outsourced him to another platform. If it were their intention to do the unification between him and Amante Stanionis, if they had done that, he wouldn't have been available to box on this show, if that's what their plan was. Looking at this, it doesn't look like that was their plan. In tandem with whatever dollar amount Netflix was willing to put up to bring this guy to their side for one fight, a one-off situation, couldn't turn it down. Now I'm left wondering if a Montes Stanionis could also end up boxing on this show because the full undercard isn't set. And I don't want to speak too soon. What I can say what, what, is that what? if a Montes Stanionis doesn't box on this undercard, or any PBC undercards in the remainder of the year. If they don't get this guy so much as a stay busy fight for what remains of this year, then that's all the more reason he should have taken Eddie Hearns' offer, because something is better than nothing. If he's in a situation where the only offer for him to do anything was coming from Matchroom, his own people don't have much for him to do. His own people aren't offering him anything. If that's the case, not saying that it is, but if it turns out to be, then he should have took Eddie's offer. Now we've got to see what, if anything, the PBC will have this guy doing in what remains of this year, because most of it is gone. We know what he's not doing. He's not fighting Mario. Upstairs in men's middleweight news, after making his middleweight debut this past weekend, Danny Garcia contemplates retiring from boxing after his defeat to Erislandi Laura. Laura. Danny ain't have no business at middleweight fighting for a middleweight title. He doesn't have the frame for it or the desire. The fire. Danny Garcia has admitted he is now reconsidering the future of his career after enduring a one-sided defeat to Erislandi Laura at the T-Mobile Arena this past Saturday. Referee Thomas Taylor stopped the fight in round nine after Garcia's father and trainer Angel Garcia threw in the towel, earning Laura a TKO victory and a successful defense of his WBA middleweight title in the process. A disappointed 36-year-old Garcia said he tried to do something great but failed. I gotta sit back and think about it, he explained. You know, I didn't have a long, long career, you know? I've been at the top of the game for 12 years. Perhaps what Danny defines as being at the top differs from most. I don't see a fighter that's been at the top for 12 years. In fact, the last two years, he was inactive. Before that, he was at welterweight, losing to every top-level welterweight they put in there with him. Would you describe that as being at the top? From the moment Danny Garcia decided to move from 140 up to 147 close to 10 years ago, he was viewed as low-hanging fruit. Asked if he agreed with his father's decision to end the fight, Garcia said for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, he's always gonna do what's best for me. I apologize to all my fans. I tried to be great tonight. The Philadelphia 
native talked about his struggles with mental health and said he tried to fight through it against the oldest Cuban champion in Lara. I overcame things outside the ring, so if you go through mental health issues, just stay strong. I tried to fight through it tonight, and it just wasn't my night. I tried my best. It just wasn't clicking. I can't. I have no excuses. You just made excuses. You're talking about stuff outside the ring? You're talking about your mental health? You don't want to make excuses. You say... Laura was just too good, and that's that. No excuses. Let's just be honest, he was being an opportunist. You thought that even though you haven't fought in two years, you could fight a 41-year-old Lara because by now he would have lost to step, and you found out the hard way that even a 41-year-old Lara is still two steps ahead of you. Meanwhile, Garcia's father and trainer said he would welcome any decision concerning his son's boxing future. It's always a great honor to be here and see Danny fight. Might be my last. I don't know. Only God knows that. I think he's got to decide whatever he wants to do, but whatever he wants to do, I'm okay with it. Did Danny Garcia have a successful boxing career? That depends on how you define success. The way I would define it, through boxing, Danny was able to improve his quality of life, expand his horizons with other business endeavors because I hear he's into real estate. I hear he owns several properties. From that scope, it was a successful boxing career because he would be leaving the sport with more than he came into it with. Success. But do I view Danny Garcia as a top-level boxer? No, I haven't viewed Danny as being a top-level boxer, an elite-level boxer in close to 10 years now. Danny, at his very best, was down there at 140. His entire welterweight campaign he lost to every solid welterweight they put in there with him. His welterweight legacy is a soundbite from his father where he said, why fight this guy when you can fight a Salka? Rod Salka, a grossly overmatched opponent they stuck in there with Danny while Danny tried to coast on easy street. It's not saying Danny always had it easy. He fought the somebodies, most of the somebodies at 147, but they all beat him. And that's not me taking shots. That's the truth. So when I see the guy disappears for two years, then gets it in his head he's going to come back as a middleweight. Wasn't his last fight at junior middleweight. The Jose Benavidez fight was, but over time, that division grew too deep for Danny. A division with guys like Madrimov and Zhu and... Xander Zayas, Sergei Bohachuk, Sebastian Fundora, Charles Conwell, Virgil Ortiz, Terence... Crawford. Danny would have been fish food at 154. Had he stayed there, he would have been fish food. He would have been low-hanging fruit all over again. So he thought he could skip that by going to a not-so-deep division to fight an aging fighter. And it didn't work. He was in over his head. Two things can be true at the same time. Danny had a successful boxing career. He managed to get something out of it. But was he really a top-level fighter? Was he really? I don't think so. If the last time Danny looked impressive was close to 10 years ago at 140 pounds, what that tells you is he hasn't been an elite fighter in a long time. He hasn't been solid, hasn't had a solid victory in a very long time. Some soft matchmaking at 147 bought him time and a, a hiatus, a two-year hiatus from the sport, that bought him even more time. But the whole time, he's had one foot halfway out the door. The fire isn't there. The desire and it hasn't been in a while danny's not a big guy you know he doesn't have a big frame if he's not at welterweight right now i don't think it's because he can't make it i think it's because he doesn't want to it's more work more effort than he wants to put out but by all rights he should still be down there right now because he's not a big guy and he's not cut out for 154 no he's not cut out for 154 we saw He's not cut out for 160. If he were more disciplined and doing what he needs to do, he probably would have still been at 147. And you probably could have given him better odds to beat, say, a Mario Barrios. Than a Lara. I do think he should retire because he's not going to beat any high-level fighters. He's not going to beat any of the high-level guys. He's going to get beat on by the high-level guys. So unless he wants to be a gatekeeper, pack it up. And finally, in men's heavyweight news, it's fight week. And attention now turns to this weekend's mega match between the reigning IBF champion Daniel Dubois and the challenger, the former champion, Anthony Joshua. Veteran fighter Dave Allen chimed in saying, from personal experience, 
Dubois is a much heavier puncher, but Anthony Joshua is sharp. Dubois hits harder, but Joshua is much faster, much more fluid, and more in combination. Dave Allen's not the only one who said Daniel punches harder than Anthony. Lauren Sokoli said the same, which we talked about in my previous video. So if we are to believe going in that the edge in power has to go to Daniel, what edge does Anthony bring to the table? The edge in experience, I would say. He is the more experienced fighter of the two, the more fluid fighter of the two, with the better range of motion, better defense. He's more responsible with his power, and he does have power, even if Daniel has more of it. That doesn't make Anthony pillow fisted, and that doesn't mean that Daniel can afford to take clean right hands to the face from Anthony like he did from Philippe Hergovic. No. Durability. I would say that Anthony's the more durable fighter of the two. There's this perception that Anthony Joshua is this fragile fighter that easily crumbles under pressure when, in fact, Daniel's been stopped more times than Anthony. It doesn't seem that way. But it's the truth. Anthony's only ever been stopped once, just once, by Andy Ruiz, whereas Daniel was stopped twice, once by Joe Joyce, then again by Oleksandr Yusik. Daniel was floored two times, two times by Oleksandr Yusik, whereas Anthony never hit the deck when he fought that fighter. He was never put down. And he fought him twice, but he was never put down, let alone put out, like Daniel. I don't think a lot of people have processed that going into this fight just as well. Daniel was put down, what was it, two, three times by Kevin Lorena, a cruiserweight that was moving up in weight. That's saying Anthony's more durable, at least historically. I think he's fought more hard punchers than Daniel. I think he has. A very hard puncher with a hefty knockout percentage in Vladimir Klitschko. Another one in Alexander Povetkin. Dillian White is a hard puncher. Not the most fundamentally sound fighter, but he can punch. He can definitely punch. You saw what he did to Derek Chisora in their second fight. He cold slept him. Joseph Parker couldn't knock out Derek Chisora. Joe Joyce couldn't knock out Derek Chisora. Dillian White did, because Dillian White is a puncher. Anthony Joshua fought Dillian White. Anthony Joshua has fought more punchers than Daniel Dubois. Klitschko, Povetkin, White, Ruiz. Francis Ngannou was a hard puncher. I know he's an MMA fighter that crossed over into boxing, but he was a hard puncher. He punched hard enough that he put Tyson Fury down. AJ put him down. Down! So if the edge in power has to go to Daniel, the edge in durability has to go to AJ. The edge in speed. Speed! Been saying it long before Dave Allen said it. Not only does Anthony Joshua have a better range of motion, he's more fluid. He can fight coming forward. He can fight moving backwards, moving lateral. He's got better range of motion than Daniel. He's more athletic, but he's faster too. Throws snappier punches. So with the speed nose feet, the speed nose hands, coupled with what power he does have, that's why I'm picking him to win. Power by itself may not be enough for Daniel to win this fight, because if power by itself determined the outcome of every single fight, well then Manny would have beat Floyd, because Manny punches harder than Floyd. George would have beat Ali, George Foreman, because he punches harder than Ali. If power always determined the outcome of a fight, that even if you give Daniel that much, you give him that edge, there's more to boxing than how hard you can punch. How well can you take a punch? So Daniel's gonna be fighting with a chip on his shoulder. He's gonna be fighting with spirit, likely the same spirit that he showed in the Hergovic fight. But in case you didn't notice, he got hit a lot in that Hergovic fight. Can't get hit like that now.